Hello and welcome to A Sense of Centerville and Washington Township, your place for stories about ordinary and extraordinary residents and places in the Centerville and Washington Township area. I'm your host, Susan Melville from Centerville, Washington History, and I look forward to hearing your story. Today, my guest is Robert Tobobbin. Robert Tobobbin, Ph.D., is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Wright State University in Dayton, Dayton, Ohio, where he taught for over 40 years. He was born in 1924 in Cleveland, Ohio. He married Janet Smith in 1947, and they became parents of two sons. Robert got a bachelor's degree from Ohio University, a master's degree from Miami University, and a Ph.D. from University of Cincinnati. He moved to Centerville around 1960 and was the first political science teacher at Wright State University. That's right. He is the author, co-author, or editor of six books and over 50 essays and articles. During World War II, he was a soldier in the 111th Infantry in the Pacific Theater and participated in three campaigns, the Gilbert Islands, the Marshall Islands, and the Palau Islands. He was a visiting fellow at Cambridge University in the 80s and traveled extensively for work and pleasure. He stays active by writing and staying physically active through walking. Thank you for being here and being willing to talk to us about some of your experiences. So as we talked on the phone, um, you shared experiences as a soldier at the age of 19. Right. Could you share a bit about what life was like during the 40s le leading up to the war? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, the, the reason I, w I, I was going to Ohio, you, I, I, this is in 1942. Incidentally, it's, uh, you might be interested in this. Um, the tuition, my tuition the first year at uh, Ohio U was $45 a semester. And I worked in the kitchen at, uh, at, uh, at uh, sorority houses to get my free food. But that that's pretty amazing because I just put Two kids through college and grandchildren through college and things like that. I joined the army for well, I thought it was a very good reason. I was going to go to Cleveland with some friends of mine. They were going to join the navy. I thought oh, I'll join the navy, but I had a date with this uh, with this. Uh, well, she was pretty hot blonde from Ironton, Ohio. I remember. I don't. I don't remember her name, but I said, "Oh, I have a date this week. I'll join the army." So you can see, I get, I didn't give any thought at all. To, I didn't care where I went. I wanted to go. Uh, in those days, everybody did really want to go. I was 18. No, I, I enlisted when I was, yeah, I enlisted on December 12th of 42. I signed up for the draft, and I had I had a draft card. I felt I was a man now. And um, I went to Ohio U in uh, September of 42, and that was my first year of, of university work. And um, I took a standard academic course, and uh, I joined the ROTC. And uh, so when the when this when that year ended, I went directly in the army on June the first of nineteen forty three. Yeah, I, I just turned eight. Eight? No, I turned nineteen. And I went. I went to. Um, I went to uh, Camp Wheeler in Georgia. It doesn't exist anymore. It was a temporary thing. And uh, I was there for three months, and then they teach you to be a soldier. You teach, that's where you got infantry training that's what i was going to be in and i as I, I went through the army i realized boy this could be very dangerous and uh Definitely. and uh, I, I remember sitting under a train saying but you you know this is dangerous and uh so i signed up for astp that's the advanced officers training corps i thought well maybe i can go back to college well i passed the test there was about half a dozen guys and uh when my when my battalion left there and they were heading for California, we, I knew they were going to the Pacific, and so did they. Um, I said, "Well, goodbye. I'll see you." And uh, and we we were left behind because we were going back to college. About two days later, they decided they didn't need any more uh, engineers or language specialists, and so uh, they just said, "No, you're back in the army, and you're not going to go to college." So I went out to uh, California. That's where I joined the 111th Infantry. They had been part of the uh, 28th Division, but
But in 1940, they 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 divided the they sent. They, there was four regiments in a division. Uh, my regiment was kicked out, and uh, the third the the uh, 28th division went to Europe. And they were in the Battle of Bulge and all that. And we went to the Pacific, and uh, I went there. And uh, because I had a year of college, they thought, well, you must be some kind of a genius. And uh, <laughs> actually, I didn't know anything. Uh, but they made me, the, uh, they said, we're going to make you into an aid man. I said, I don't know anything about it. He said, we'll teach you on the boat going over. And uh, so, and they didn't. They didn't do anything. Uh, we went over to Hawaii, and, and I could have joined any battalion. Any, there's three battalions in a regiment in those days. And I, I, they said, you can walk into any line you want. So I walked into a third battalion because it was closest. And I... Uh, and two weeks later, we we're heading out for the first campaign, and the other ones, the other two battalions, stayed in Hawaii for a year while we were out, and we were going on. And what was um, a big campaign? Uh, the first, well, it was really the first campaign in the Central Pacific. I, there's two. You have to understand the Pacific War. There's two campaigns. There's a Central Pacific, and there's a Southwest. Uh, MacArthur had the Southwest. I had. I was in the, what was going to be headed by Nimitz. And uh, Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz, and we went out to. A, you may have heard of this battle, Tarawa. It was a big battle, of, and uh, we uh, that was taken by the all by the, by the Marines. I went to the next island up, which was Macon Island. That was an army operation, and uh, uh, Tarawa was a terrible battle. Ours was not. Uh, we had about twelve hundred, fifteen hundred Japanese soldiers there, and they were taken out in three days. And um, then the assault troops, oh, let me make this clear. When, when you go out on a campaign, there's assault troops. That's the ones that, that would go in on the first wave, okay? Okay, these guys get beat up so bad that they have, you know, they have with death and uh, with uh, wounds that they pull them out as soon as, the, as soon as the fighting actually ends. The fighting ended in two and a half days. And uh, then we went in. Then, then my regiment goes in, and we're called Mop Up. We're we're basically a support regiment. Uh, but but we were only a battal one battalion. The third battalion went in, and we went in there. And uh, uh, every night, every oh every day, we would get bombed and occasionally strafe. Bombing uh, uh, became so you can tell where the bombs are coming. Oh. That might be a story. You want me to tell that? The first night, the sergeant said, dig in. And um, although my friend and I, his name was John Serval, we dug it about four inch hole. And we said, well, that'll be okay. Well, then the, the air raid sirens went off and the Japanese planes came over and we could hear the bombs dropping. It was really kind of beautiful. The way, you know, palm trees were waving and the lights were going in. We're shooting at them and we're missing them by a mile. And uh, we had we had fighters up there, and they were P-40 uh, fighters. And then suddenly we heard this shoom, and the bombs came very close. And we leaped in on top of two married men. Married men are always more diligent about doing their work. Oh, gosh. And, uh, and then, then after that, then we really did dig in. So the purpose uh, of digging in is to... To protect yourself. To protect yourself. Yeah, you yourself. dig a foxhole. You dig a hole. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you dig a hole it. and you get down. Uh, then we built the next day. We got uh, we we picked out a space, and we built a shelter. We'd have to take a direct hit. I've been in bombs where oh, the bombs were from here to that door, no farther than that. Five of them went by, and our so our like thing like twenty feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it and the, the whole the whole thing caved in on us. The, the we had logs over it. We we could only be killed by uh, straight bombing. Uh, Bombing isn't so bad if you, you eventually, we had so many of them, like 40 or 45 times. Oh, I kept the diary too, so I know how many times we were bombed and everything. And uh, you're not supposed to keep a diary, but I kept it anyway. So why don't you, why aren't you supposed to keep a diary? I don't know if they think the Japanese might capture cap it someday and okay. make it information. But I've always done that all my life, read, read books and uh and right, yeah. Right, and and just um, for the people, uh, yeah. some of your some of your stories are listed in um, yeah in the books you've you've got a memoir called Common 
warfare. Yeah, yeah. And um, you can buy it from uh, if you want, uh, but it is. I wanted to make sure there's a difference between assault soldiers and support. Okay. I was support. Okay. So that's a, a safer place to be. Well, yes, yeah. of course, yeah. yeah, because like we went on to the. Uh, well, eventually we went to the Palau Islands. That would be a year later. And uh, the 1st Marine Division went into Peleliu. 1st Marine Division, in six weeks, they ceased to exist as a fighting unit. The corporals were running companies. That's usually done by a lieutenant or a captain. The, the assault is really different, okay? Then they send in the 80, the, uh, the 84. 81st Infantry Division, they secured the island, then my group goes in, and we, and they pull the other ones that are really badly wounded, they pull them out, and we went in, and we do, what we called ourselves mop-up troops, that's what we did. We took islands that they didn't want to bother taking, and uh, like in the Marshall Islands, we took 11 islands, but uh, there would only be 15 to 25 Japs on an island, and we would kill them, or capture them, or they would kill themselves. And uh, that happened in one case. Uh, but 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 you have to make it, we make his, I'm making a distinction between assault and support. I was, I was never assault. I was always in this, well, we were only about 13, 1400 people. We can't run up against Islands with 20,000 Japanese soldiers with that, that would, they wouldn't last. Wow. And uh, so that's where, that, those are some stories. But. No, that, that, that's perfect. Um, it, it sounds like a really hard, hard time. That, that is challenging. Um, but one of the things that I, I thought was interesting is not only writing your own stories, but then a couple, uh, I think it's a couple decades ago, you started to yeah. interview some of the, the people in Centerville and Washington Township yeah, they, yeah, that yeah. had served. I, I interviewed 44 veterans of World War II 44. that were in the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Corps, and Coast Guard. So why did you choose to, to do that? Well, I, I had been in a war, and I had seen it, and I always liked writing I always take notes. Even when I go, when I leave this, I'll go home. I'll start work. I'm working on two books right now, mm -hmm. and I'm 98. But but that's what I do. That's okay. It's like mm -hmm. you're you, dr you're driven to do that. Yeah, I've always liked it. I, so I, what was that experience like interviewing those those well, veterans? Well, I, I can give you the, the, actually in the book. Uh, I had the 44. They wouldn't do it. The uh, The publisher wouldn't do it because they, they were in there to make money. Right. They would only do 30. So I picked out 30 of the best ones. There was a, there was a Marine, for example. Now, uh, I know something about Marines. Both my uncles were World War I Marines. And, uh, they're, they're very good. They're all fighters. Okay. This is the best example I can give. There was a there's a marine outfit that t they were t they took the island of Guam that's in the uh, uh, Marianas Islands you can look it up on a map someplace it's the southernmost island and Marines landed and they went through and they they went so fast they bypassed a lot of Japanese positions and so they said okay now you can come back and do it all over again and that's what they had them doing and this one Marine Carl Rotterman who's from Centerville he's probably dead now. I'm sure they're all dead. And, That's uh, why you recorded the stories. Yeah, yeah right. so they were preserved. And he said, uh, I, d I went on a lot of patrols, for example. Not a, that's how a lot of warfare takes place as far as I was concerned, patrols, where you have about 12 guys. And uh, see, I was their aid man. That's like your doctor, okay? I was really pathetic, but I could take care of, I could take care of a lot of things. I still can. Uh, and... Uh, Carl said, uh, he said, I was a scout. Uh, I said, well, well uh, I was on patrols a lot of times. And he said, um, I said, what do you do as a scout? He said, the most fearsome thing I ever heard was my sergeant would say, this is a quote, scouts, scouts forward and draw fire. What that meant was if you were the scout, you would go forward until the enemy starts shooting at you then they will, then, then, and I said, but won't they kill you or wound you? 
And he said, oh, of course, that's why you do it. But, but, the, but the sergeant will say, I have to do that because then I'll know where they are and then we'll kill them. So you find out with that one quote that you as an individual are really not important. What is important is the mission, okay? You've got to, we've got to find the, where the Japanese are and they're hiding, of course. And uh, he said, scout forward and draw fire. That's what he meant. You go forward and you do it. And if you don't do it, you you couldn't live. You couldn't live. If your sergeant says you're going on to Bob and you're going on patrol today, say, okay, I'm going. I had very, very little contact with, I don't think I had hardly any contact with officers. I always dealt with my sergeant. My sergeant told me what to do. That's what I'm doing. And you you do this to get along because you've got to get along in the Army. I don't know anything about the Navy. We used to tease them uh, when we were on. We were on a lot of ships. and uh, But I do know something about the Army. And uh, when sergeant tells you to do something, you do it. Or I did, anyway. And I had no problem. And, and uh, you know, that would, that would be, that's what a scout does. Right. Sir, it's, Spooky. Well, yeah. a lot of the, I mean, a lot of younger people, including myself, you know, this, those stories are, and I'm just grateful that you recorded them yeah. so that they that's are there yeah. For, yeah. for next generations. And that's what we're trying to do through this podcast is sharing these stories for a next generation. And so let's get back to your story. Okay. okay. Um, so you get out of the war. You go back to school. Yeah, my mother said to me, well, now it's time uh, she wanted me to leave the house. I think I was always sort of a heartache to them because uh, I pretty much did what I wanted to do as a kid. and uh, But I happened to like school, and uh, that was good. And uh, he said, oh, you're supposed to get married. Well, I found out that I was only, my, my girlfriend in high school was only about 16 or 17. Well, you can only, when you're 16 or 17, Sitting around, I, would, I didn't see anybody for two and a half years, so she picked up with somebody else, and and so I went to Ohio, and that's where I met my wife, and we eventually married. Had these, I graduated eventually, uh, worked for a couple of oil companies for about ten years, and then I went uh, back to school. Yeah, because I, because that's what I liked. You, you were good at school, and yeah. And you, why? How did you pick political science? As oh, your, okay. As your this career? this is the this is the God's truth. Okay. Uh, I thought I would be a history major because I always liked that, and so I said, Janet, you have to go and sign in for me, uh, because at Miami University, that's where I was going for my master's. And so she, when she came home, I said, what are, what am I taking? She said, you're taking a course in political science. I said, history, history. And she said, well, they were all filled up. So I said, it's all, she said, it's all the same thing anyway. That's how I got into so being political mistake, science. it was a mistake, actually. It was a mistake, yeah. yeah. I think all, a lot of life is mistakes. But uh, good mistakes. A, yeah, good, good mistake. mistakes. Like I yeah. met her on a mistake. Uh, I, kn- I, knew, I knew Janet's sister because I dated her. Janet's sister's roommate back in 42. And she was already married or something to somebody else. And she, and she said, would you go out on a date with my, with my, I saw her at the, at the grill. I said, went over and asked her to dance. I always liked dancing too. I know girls like to dance too. Uh, or they did in those days anyway. And uh, I still like to dance. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I still enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's how I met Janet, my wife. It was a blind, most people meet on a blind date or something, or it's fixed up, or and it's an accident. You really mm-hmm. happy, happy accidents. Yeah, yeah. So you became a teacher. Now, talk about what brought you to Centerville and okay. Wright State University. Okay, I, I I was transferred here. I I can't. I left Sun Oil. I only worked for them for a couple of years. Then I worked with Shell Oil, which I consider a first rate company. They were really good, and they were very good to me. I have no complaints. But I just found the work boring after a while. I was. First of all, I start. You start as a salesman, and then you become a merchandiser. And then I was doing real estate, and I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. Where you buy, you buy uh, properties that you believe will be a future gas station in those days. Now I guess we're going out of the gas business, going to electricity. But um, it, even that becomes, to me, wasn't exciting at all. So I, I went back to school in nineteen fifty. 
I think I started in 50, 53, 4, 5, right in there. Mm-hmm. I went back to Miami University and got a master's degree. Then I was invited to get a PhD at Ohio State, and and that and I did that. And that means when you're going for the PhD, you're going for research. Well, that's what I've always liked. I've always liked reading and writing, and, and I loved my classes. I would do it for nothing. Uh, it's, it's, for me, it was great. And uh, it's perfect that you found your yeah. your your passion, the thing yeah. that you love. Yeah. So, um, so from what I read, that you were the first political science teacher at Wright State right, University, that's right. yeah. and you had moved to Centerville at that time. Yes, is, because is Jenna had right? a job; she was teaching here in Centerville. Okay. So I, I, I took this job, and um, it was offered to me, and I, I said nobody wanted to come here. Uh, they, everybody. If you've ever been to Miami, it's it's a it's a wonderful school. I t- taught on campus and off campus. I taught Nettie Lee, Nettie Lee Roth out on Germantown for Miami, and I taught on campus too. And then this job at Rice State opened up, and they had to have somebody, and nobody wanted to come. I said, I'll go, because that's where I was living. I had to drive to Miami every day, or not every day, about three days a week. So I came over here, and uh, I started the political science department, and I taught in it for 42 years. And that's where I got, I taught at University of Cincinnati too, but really only for a year or two there. But mostly Miami. Then Miami staffed the liberal arts at Wright State, and Ohio State staffed engineering and mathematics. To uh, kind of build up the program yeah. over the years. And I went to the first class meeting, the first meeting was in September of 64. There were 54 faculty and two administrators. And... uh that's how it all started. Taught there from 64 until my last class was 2006, 42 years. I lived every day of it. I, I'm very fortunate. I've had a very good life. And uh, it was, it was, it was, it's just what I was doing anyway. That's what I'm going to do when I go home from this conversation we're having. I'll, I'll, I'm working on a book now. Putin just ruined my book. I had a, It's all done. And then he invades. And I... And, my, my 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 book was about starting a dialogue between. There's no point in talking to Putin. There's uh, he's going to lie anyway. He's going to cheat. Uh, I think I think he's a tyrant. And we have this. Well, this very interesting guy called uh, Zelensky or something he, like that. I think yeah. it is like yeah. It's just pretty close. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he's a comedian, stand-up comedian, actually. Yeah, he, he was is. in a show. Yeah, uh, and, and he's calling them Nazis. He's a Jew. Uh, his parents, he, he's not a practicing Jew, right. but he's a very brave guy, and he's out there, and he won't even leave the city of Kiev. They're supposed to take the whole country in two days. Well, it's been four weeks now, and uh, I think I think they're holding their own uh, from what I can see. That's all I have is— The right is on their side, yeah, you know, just yeah. but that— yeah, there's a lot of uh, political science. Yeah. Always, it's very interesting to study about those. Things. It ruined my book that I'm working on. It really yeah. did. I was all done with it. It was to start a dialogue. I don't think there's much point in talking to them. They're That's... even they're killing. Uh, they're targeting civilians. That doesn't do any good. Yeah. You kill. That means there's just less food. But if you don't kill the fighters, mm-hmm. uh, they're going to keep fighting, and they're. I think they're holding their own, at least as of this date they are. It's a terrifying thing to think yeah. about war still happening yeah. after, you know, you're almost 98 years. And, you know, that was the World War Two should yeah. have been the world, the war to end all wars. Yeah, and but sadly, the, that's not the case. Not, no. Let's come back to Centerville. OK. Um, so what was it like when you moved here in 1960? Where we bought this house. I won't even hesitate to say the price, but you couldn't even buy a car for what we pay for our house. Not honestly, God, uh, uh, I don't know what it's worth. I get every week I get letters from people saying we'll pay you cash for your. Well, I'm not selling my house, of course. Yeah, it's where your would place you go? to live. So uh, we moved here, and uh, Janet got a job. Uh, we had two boys, and she didn't go to teaching until the until the youngest one went full time. Uh, she was teaching in, in uh, we were living in Kettering at that time. She 
Like she, she was teaching at, uh, what was that? Well, was she a middle school teacher? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, she, was yes she, she was. She was elementary, yeah. Oh, elementary. Uh, okay. Elementary or. What did she teach? She taught, she taught everything. She taught sixth, seventh, and eighth. She ended up at MagSeek for about 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And she taught sixth, seventh, and eighth grade because I would help her set up her room. And uh, I can remember those years very well. There was, uh, so you were both educators. Yeah, right. And she, because, but with, with public school teaching, it's much more difficult than university teaching. I only had to teach seven classes a year out at Wright State. And that was considered a heavy load. So you had, but you had to do a lot more school. Uh, to yeah, we get have to, to do PhD, you have to, yeah. you know, writing. You you must was they never say that publisher parish, but that's really the sort of the that's that's why you go into PhD is to do research and write. Okay, and uh, she taught here, so I was very glad to get it and it worked great for us. And I. Uh, uh, so you stayed here all those years. What kinds of things did you... Well, I got into interdisciplinary teaching. Oh, one, right. one day I was walking down the hall and I saw Nick, Nick Piazcalzi. He was the chairman of the religion department. He had a picture of Karl Marx on his... I said, that's my area. What are you doing with that picture on there? He told me about this thing called the Marxist Christian dialogue. Well, of course, Marxists and Christians are about as far apart as you can get. Uh, ideologically, and that's what I, I taught ideology. So uh, uh, we thought we'll have a Marxist Christian dialogue here in Dayton. We held one at Wright State uh, in 1968, the first one. Yeah. And then it, then it started going, and we did one at American University in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Then we were invited to go with dialogues, and we did dialogues in the Soviet Union. In uh, Kishinev. In what what uh, decade was that? That was that 19, you... It was the year of 1978. Wow, that's so early yeah. to be going oh, yeah. to the Soviet Union. Yeah, 78. We did one in Salzburg. We did one in Yugoslavia, and we did one in Sweden. Those are the ones I can think of at the moment. Mm -hmm. But those were very helpful to me, really helpful, because of what, it, what, what it was is you would have a topic, like, say, alienation. Okay, then I would... All these different professors from all over Russia and uh, our Soviet Union and uh, America, we would meet there. We happened to meet in, in we went to Kishinev. That we went to Moscow. I said, "Can't we stay here over?" No, no. They have only Plan A. They don't have any Plan B. We were they very restricted tired. your travel. Yeah, we had yeah. to fly fifteen hundred more miles down to Kishinev, Moldova, and we went down there, and that's where we conducted it. So I was in there for about two, three weeks in in Russia. Then I came back home. Did your family go with you on this trip? I always took my wife went on every single trip to Europe. She's never leaving me when she was because she was she loved all those trips. She loved to travel yeah, as yeah, well. She did. did you enjoy the travel or just the dialogue? Was the no, I I like to travel. That's a great education to travel. I didn't know that people could take two hours for lunch. <laughs> and like in France, that's what it is. You take about twenty minutes here. I know, yeah. And you get a stomach ache, or and, you eat at your desk, or something. Or you eat at your desk, and then, yeah. and then she. I remember when I think of my wife, I think of her grading at night, every night till eleven o'clock. She'd be grading something. I don't know. I mean, I graded too, but public school teacher, my neighbor was that's an easy job. I said you couldn't do it, friend. I, maybe you could do it for a week. I doubt it. But for 30 years, no way. It, uh, it takes a toll, it for really sure. It really does, mm -hmm. yeah. Are you a teacher? I'm not. I did um, I did preschool classes okay. for a while. I taught okay. preschool classes. Okay. And well, you have five kids, but yeah, I mean, you can't do anything. I had my anything. own little preschool, didn't I? Jeez. <laughs> no. I, I, I mean, I love children, but it takes a toll on your body yeah. to... Yes, it does. To, to, ...to do that all the time. So... Um, so you you moved here. You chose to live in Centerville. Why did you choose to stay in Centerville? For the schools. For That's the it. schools. I, I don't have any children, of course, anymore, but I vote for everything because I believe the school system is why the, that's why the, the people are here. They, they come for the school systems. That's why they'll pay an absurd price for my house today because they want to go to, oh, okay, Centerville, Kettering, or Oakwood. That's it. This way, I understand my community. 
Right. And I, I believe I know education was important for us when we well, were sure. Chosen. I mean, yeah. because because you're raising it, a it determines your. I believe it's associated with your your children's future. They 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 hang out with kids who are other kids who are going to go to school. You know, you're like your mother used to say, who, "Who are you going around with? Who are you hanging around with?" My mother would say, and but I always hung out with academics because that's what I liked. I can't help you. Can't really help. You can't really explain things like that. I got interested in reading stories by Zane Grey and Jack London when I was a kid. I thought, wow, what a great adventure. Those were adventure stories. Yeah, you know. Was it the Wild West, Zane Grey? Or, yes, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really was for I me. hadn't read that. That's not my genre. I remember but... saying, you put down that book, Bobby Payton. That's what my teacher would say that. But, but so I've, nobody had encouraged me to read or write because I, that's what, I, that's that's what, what I've been doing. That's what you love to do. And I, I, you know, I wasn't a heavy reader growing up, but when my kids were young, that was my escape, is the reading. And I've always loved to write. Well, um, okay, then So we're kindred spirits there. Um, I also love, you know, walking and exercising and things like that. Political science, I think I'm behind the curve on understanding, but my husband loves to politics. To, loves politics yeah. and I'll I can get him going talking about that. Um so let's talk a little bit about oh, you wanted to share a story about Paul Newman. Okay. So why don't you share that story? Okay. Now? Uh in 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 high school, my senior year. You're up in the I knew Paul. I, I was in Shaker High School. That's mm -hmm. where I was born and raised in Shaker High School. Went through the whole school system. It was supposed to be a model community or something like that. And uh, I went. I went to Moreland Elementary School and the junior high and the high school. In the high school, in my mm -hmm. senior year, Paul Newman incidentally was a year behind me in school. I graduated in, in those days. We graduated midterm too. I graduated in January of '42. World War. World War II began in December 1st. I graduated six weeks later. So I know that I'm going to the Army. So our, our part in the war, because it yeah, had happened in yeah, Europe oh, Yeah, because that. we, uh -huh. we didn't go in until December 1st, right. or December 7th. Mm -hmm. After uh, Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor. And so then I signed up, and I was, I'm going to go to college, of course. And uh, so I did that. And that's where I joined the uh, my junior ROTC, and uh, the, when when the when the first year ended, they allowed me to finish, or or if I if I would have dropped out, I would be in the army immediately. Well, I wanted to finish my first year, so I did. And June the first of forty three, I went in the army. And I told you a little bit about that. Right. I had three campaigns, and I, so and maybe I, we should mention for people who don't know who Paul Newman is. Um, he was a very famous actor when yeah. I was growing up, with, and who famous for his yeah, bright the, blue he eyes. The, the cat, he was on The Cat in the Hot Tin Roof with Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, that, and he was also, my favorite one was um, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Butch Sundance Butch Cassidy and the Sundance mm -hmm. Okay, he was and in a lot of things. The Entertainer. The Entertainer? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I never missed any. Well, anyway, in high school, uh -huh. and I have, you, can, you have the uh, program there. Okay. I tried out for a part, and I'm I I don't think I'm not I'm not a good actor at all. I I can't get into the part. I'm sort of like a stick of wood. That's how I see myself. I'm not I'm not an actor at all. But anyway, Paul Newman in the, in the play, he was a junior, junior, and he didn't even get a part. He got he was on lights, and you can see it in the in the program which I brought. Mm -hmm. I think I have. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right yeah. Here. And. Uh, if you if you know the play Hamlet, it's the most difficult play probably for the for the lead actor that there is. So fifteen, sixteen hundred lines. I had quite a few lines. I was Guildenstern. He's sort of like a second rate spy, or uh, that's that's what he uh, Guildenstern. Not a very not a not a man of real character. He not wasn't even a decent guy. I think he was sort of a spy of some kind. Anyway. Uh, Paul Newman, who I knew, now he was not a, he not a like a buddy or anything like that, but he, I knew him. He knew me, and uh, uh, one time in California, I have the letter. I brought it for uh, Susan. It's here. All the letters between us. He gave an interview to somebody out in California, and he said that, it, and he said, and it was published in a magazine 
that he played the part of Gillenstern. So Jack wrote me, Jack was Hamlet. He said, Bob, when he comes to the reunion, you should really nail him, you know, on this. Because I was skilled in CERN, and he wasn't. He, he was on lights, uh, and uh, uh, I have other stuff in here. Do, but do you show the picture, Paul? Yeah, yeah. There's a picture where, of where him is right it? here. Oh, it's right here. Oh, um, okay, that's and okay. Then there's the anyway, program. he didn't come to the reunion, and so I wrote him a letter, and I said, Paul, this would be about ten years later. I didn't do anything for about seven or eight years, but then I wrote him a letter, and I said, Paul. I see where you've given this interview, and you said that you were Gillenstern. I said, uh, you must have been riddled with guilt all these years because uh, because you know damn well that I was uh, Gillenstern, and you were on lights, man, and uh, which isn't exactly saying a great thing. I've often thought the director who picked us, his name was Fry. I'm sure he's dead. because He'd be about 110 now or something. Right, yeah. Well, that was... It was probably because Jack, my friend, was Hamlet. He said, put, put Bob in there. What does it matter anyway? And I don't know what really went on, how he got the part, but that's that's the story. It's so ironic, this great actor. Yeah. didn't even make his high school No, he didn't. Play. No, he right. was on life. And that, and so, this, you know. I met this one woman. She wouldn't believe it. Uh, I, said, I said, no, I'm telling you the truth, man. Why would I lie about something like that? Uh, I don't think lying is very good to do anyway. Uh, right. Uh, but you had the proof that you yeah, were... <laughs> I mean, uh, so, and he wrote me back a nice letter. He said, "My head is turned into fizz and bubbles." He liked to drink beer, and that's what he blamed it on. And uh, he was kidding. And I have a signed letter by him there, someplace uh -huh. in that file. That's the Paul Newman story, and it's fun to tell to your grandchildren that that's all it is. Yeah, yeah, that it is. Oh, here it is. Yeah, uh, yeah Paul Newman, right here. Yeah. Yeah. There is the letter from yeah. Paul Newman. Yeah. So great story. It's always nice to have a little brush with fame. And, yeah, that's, and, that's, and especially that that you had the part and he Yeah, see, he, he, he I, I think he honestly for I me mean, if you're in all you yeah. know, Elizabeth Taylor and all these great films and he he got to be acting even when he's uh, quite old. And then he has the brand name with all yeah, with of all the, that food. I all I always food. buy that, of course. Yeah, because you yeah cause yeah you because and he's a there. he's a he's given and he has given over three hundred million dollars to charity from his uh, food things. He takes nothing. He doesn't need money. I think his daughters now run it. He had three or four daughters with Joanne Woodward, and uh, so a family business. Yeah, I knew his brother too. Art now, Art Newman was in my class, and I see where I once when I would see his name too. He sneak in on a picture or something, doing producing or designing dresses or whatever he did. I don't know, All but right. uh, his brother Paul he Paul was the actor, of course. Mm -hmm. In fact, Art wasn't. Paul Newman was very handsome. Art really wasn't. <laughs> well, a, hopefully he doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't care if he listens. <laughs> no, okay. Their so, father, their father owned Newman Sports in Cleveland, and oh, okay, that's, yeah, he, pretty athletic family. Yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've been retired for a couple of decades, and yeah, in nineteen two thousand six is the last class I okay. taught. So not not quite two. Yeah, you, you had a long, long yeah, career. Yeah. So what have been your favorite things to do since you've been retired? Because you've stayed very busy still. In 1972, I was uh, I had a sabbatical leave, and I went over to Cambridge University because it's been around for 900 years, and uh, uh, it was a good place to do research. They have a wonderful library there. In the course of the thing, I met a guy called um, Richard Eden. Richard Eden was the, he founded a college called Clare Hall. And so in 1980, I had another sabbatical leave, or 80, 81 academic year. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to him, I said, uh, I've been doing this stuff. I got, here's my publications and so on. I, I, I think I have six books and about 50 articles or something. He said, I said, how can I get affiliated over there? He said, well, how about coming to our college? And so I said, great. And so they gave me an apartment there at, at Clare Hall in Cambridge for the year. I could only come there for two semesters because I had to teach. Uh, that was, this would be in 1980, 81. Oh, yeah, I'm teaching still full time right, at yeah. Rice State. I said, I can't get off that long. So he said, we'll come for the winter and the spring. They call them Michael Mass Lent and Easter. 
They're ten week terms. Uh-huh. I came for Mike uh, Lent and Easter. Yeah, I was there. And uh, Michael Mass is like September. I yeah. think it's close to yeah. that time frame. Yeah, and uh, my neighbor was a guy called uh, uh, Thomas Bresdorf. He was a professor at Co- uh, University of Copenhagen. And I still, I just sent him a Christmas card or no, a birthday card. His birthday is April first. Yeah, and I'm. I'll be. I'll be ninety eight, and he will be. I don't know. I say eighty eight, something like that. He's retired too, of course. Uh, he's a good guy, and we used to uh, talk, and uh, that was probably the the greatest year of my of our our married life, uh, because you're meeting all these different students. Oh, well, my college is a graduate college. The only people who could attend my college would be uh, masters and PhDs. In That's Cambridge, it. In okay. Cambridge. I don't I don't mean to make anything out of that. It just happened to be that. Uh, because they have students from all over the world that come to Cambridge, and I had, I had these half a dozen students. I remember this guy from Venezuela, Italy, South Africa, a woman from South Africa, and someplace elsewhere. Sudan, oh, the Sudan, yeah. And uh, uh, you you have very intimate relations with them. We would go out to eat, and we would go to parties together. And you talk. That's all you do is you talk. And like at 1030 in the morning, if you're at the library, they ring a bell. That means it's time to go have your coffee. And then at 12 o'clock, you go back to, or 1 o'clock, you go to eat lunch. Then at 4 o'clock, you, eat, you go to the Senate to have coffee again. Then you have dinner later on. And oh, the interesting thing, you'd be interested in this, particularly lunch. They want you to be here at lunch. And you could not sit with your wife. You had to, you, 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 I would go with Janet there. And then we would split up. They want you to sit any place. And interact not, with other people. Right. Not uh, your spouse. That's the whole. And so you end up meeting the guys who are studying volcanoes. I remember that particularly. I don't know why. A volcano and uh, people who study, you know, sociology. And, well, that's where uh, the, the, uh, DNA is discovered, uh, and I wasn't there at that time. That was in 53. That's Watson, James Watson. He was at Cambridge, too. And they, so the great thing about that is that you're talking about a yeah. lot of different things and interacting with right. people that maybe know things different than you. It's a great way to, like, collaborate or just expand your understanding about right. life. So my big friend was this guy, Thomas Bresdorf. And, you know, in 1848, when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, Okay, this was probably the most powerful writing ever done on uh, why these and there were 30 revolutions broke out the next year in Europe and Asia and even in the Ottoman Empire. The only one that succeeded, the one did, Denmark. Denmark overthrew the, the uh, uh, absolute monarch and they in, installed a, a constitutional monarchy and they still have a constitutional monarchy. And Thomas Bresdorf is... Uh, the professor, or he was there. I think he's retired now. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure. You know, and uh, but that was a wonderful year for us. Uh, I think of it. Uh, then uh, in '93, by this time I had a, a lot of publication stuff going, and uh, I was invited to be uh, a visiting professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So I went there, and uh, and uh, Jen and I, and th- this is. This is on the mainland as opposed to Hong Kong as an island, okay? Mm-hmm. So I was on the mainland. That's where the Chinese University of Hong Kong is located. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was a visiting professor for one month, the month of January of 93. And I was going to, I only had to give two lectures, one on Marx and one on biology. The one on Marx, they weren't even hardly interested in. What they were interested in is biology and politics. And uh, I had taught a course with my son at, at Rice State for 12 years. I know enough biology that I'm dangerous, okay? <laughs> uh, I, wrote, I can write books about it, or I have written. I really shouldn't have, because you read it, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, it's, it's about biotechnology and about uh, babies, raising babies and things like that. That's this one, Issues yeah, in yeah, American yeah, Political Life, Money, Violence, 
and biology. Yeah. And now my partner there, he just died. He's a very young man. He was only 71. And you don't want to, you want to take care of yourself too. He worked very hard and he just died, had a stroke and that was it. And the other one, Donna Schleich, she she's retired now, although she's still pretty active. But but I can't write a book with him now because he's, he, not here. He, he's not here. So I'm working on a couple now. That's I'll work until I drop. I know I will. And that's probably what yeah. keeps you young and vibrant is yeah. that you you always have something to do yeah. every every day. When I go home, when I go home from this, I'll be working on a. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have you have a lot of friends that you get together with, and yeah. you seem to stay. I, I go to a coffee group. Sometimes they talk about golf, or they talk about. I'm using this. I mean, they're nice guys. They're all nice guys, but they. I'd rather be talking about something else, like I, politics. Yeah, and yeah, I would. Current I events really would. So I, I, I try events. to go once a week. Now I'm going back. I went with Jerry Strange. Uh, Last Friday, five, three or four days ago. Oh, did you? Yes, and I'm going to go this Friday again. I usually go once a week. Yeah, you know, I go to that, and we drink coffee and just talk. It was just old guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody needs a connection. I think that was what we learned over the last two years is that we have to have oh ways to communicate with, with people and interact and keep our minds sharp. Those are all very important. Uh, how, how are we doing on time? Are we doing? We're doing great. We got about five minutes. Left. No. Oh, really? Yeah. My God. Let me see if there's anything else. Okay. Yeah. The, the thing, the thing that I would, can I push something? Anything you'd if, like, if you yes. get, if you get a chance to be a, if you're a teacher, if you can do some interdisciplinary teaching, that has been a, oh, just a, a wonderful thing for me. I, and there's like, for example, I'm interested in, I'm quite interested in religion, not in conventional religion now, uh -huh. but there's a woman called Elaine Pagel. She teaches at Princeton, so she's probably not a shuf, okay? She's really sprite. She has a, two books out, one called The Gnostic Gospels and one called Beyond Belief. It, it was, These two books, um, boy, it, if I didn't even know about them uh, when I was in the dialogue thing. She was working on there. But um, so it's, it's interdisciplinary. And the work with my son in biology if you want, if you want to get close to somebody, you work with them on a project. Then you, then you, then you are close. That's why marriage is where the people are working together, and you know, in raising children. I suppose. Not, not, not that I was a great. I think I was an adequate father, but no more than that because, I mean, I didn't live for them. I mean, I've, they're very. They're, I talk to them all. No, I talked to my one, my oldest son. Probably once or twice a week. My youngest one, he lives in North Carolina, you know, three or four times a week. We just, and I can, I have, oh, I have two sons, eight grandchildren, and 13 great-grandchildren. And even some of them, are they're getting pretty good. I got one who's 17. He'll go to, I know he'll go to Madison. He lives in Wisconsin. Uh -huh. He's a good student. So read books, you guys. Um, and uh and you know, keep and, keep your mind going. Yeah, yeah. And 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 but oh, and be active. Well, and I love what you said about working with people. And I actually think you know that advice to not make your life revolve around your children is great advice for for people today. Is to have some of your own things that you're involved in. That's that keeps your mind yeah, engaged because you know you, you know you're born, mm -hmm. you live. And a good good part of the living is going to involve some suffering, too. It they really will, and then you die. But the strange thing is, if you if you um, if you create some a book or a painting, or 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 anything, anything, or, or maybe you're a great dancer, or maybe you're an architect, or maybe you, you uh, th this leader of the whole Ukrainian revolution, he's a stand-up comedian and an actor. I mean. And people are, I see them giving standing ovations. I mean, he's a very brave guy. And he said he's going to stay there and he'll fight and die there. And, I mean, so we shouldn't shove these people apart. Uh, they're, they're, 
that's proof, I think. I mean, he's he giving the Russians all they can they can handle. So, I think it's a stalemate myself right now. So I basically, I th- what I what I hear you say is make sure you have you're leaving something. Yeah, le- leaving some ma- leaving the world a better. Yeah, better place. now you know for for like for women, I've always said they have a little advantage because boy, when they when they're when they're because they actually grow this human being in their uterus. And uh, it must be an amazing thing to give birth to a child. Well, you know, a man, his role is very limited. Uh, and uh, But you need to do your best. And uh, Yes, I, I, my children are my, my greatest well, sure, creative it's, experience, yes. You, do you have grandchildren yet? No. Oh, well, it's, you will sometime. I hope, I hope that oh, happens. Oh, I'm sure soon. you will. And and if not, you know so that's I, okay that's too. That's great too. Yeah, that's yeah. that's if that's the balls in their court. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have loved visiting with you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having I, me. It was a delight to be with you. To wrap up, I'd like to thank uh, Miami Valley Communication Council for producing this podcast, and my guest Robert Tobobin for taking the time to be here today. Uh, If you have an interesting Centerville story, please contact Centerville Washington History. We want to hear your story. Please also come and visit our museums Tuesday through Friday, 12 o'clock to 4 p.m. We have three locations, 26 North Main Street, 89 West Franklin, and 78 North Main Street. For more information about historical buildings and people, please check our website, centervillewashingtonhistory.org. Thank you. Bye-bye.